And we're here in our second week of our exciting 10th anniversary college wrestling season. We're bringing you on Tuesday nights at 9 o'clock and also some weekends. And we'll show you that schedule later, so stick around. Well, Doug, I'm real interested in some of the off-the-mat features. And tonight we're going to take a look at Lou Bannock, former national champion from Iowa U. And also we're going to show you a few exciting moments from a match in 1981 between two national champions. But it's Oklahoma tonight. It's the Sooners. And, you know, there aren't very many teams that have a chance against Iowa. This is one of them. Yes, this is really a strong team. Uh, Oklahoma was second in the Nationals last year. They've got five All-Americans back. Now, they can make a run at Iowa. Yeah, and they have a leader in Stan Abel, who's one of the most respected coaches in the game. Well, he's probably the nation's premier recruiter. Uh, Stan has really done a great job of recruiting. He's got some real strong men. He's had 190 wins, 14 years of coaching. Uh, this is one of the real good coaches. Well, we noticed that he's undefeated this year, but he does have some very close match meets. All of them are close. Well, I think that one of the problems is that they haven't solidified those first four weight classes. Uh, they just have had men up and down in the lineup, and this will be the time for them to get going. But we're going to show you two All-Americans right now in the middle and upper weights, 167 and 190. Now, LaViolet is a bona fide All-American. He was third last year with 11-8 loss to the eventual champion. And, of course, Dan Chade is the man that beat Iowa's Goldman in the finals. As so many times, Iowa is ranked number one. They've just finished up their eighth straight NCAA championship season. But, you know, for the first time, I hear this rumor that they're looking back over their shoulder this year. Uh, I'm not sure they should be. Uh, this is really a strong team, Doug. There isn't a team in the country that could put seven men in the finals oh. of the Midlands. And they are strong because everybody agrees one man has led this team to its success, right? This man right here, he's the coach, Dan Gable. Uh, Gable is really the premier coach. He was a premier wrestler. Uh, he's very intense. His team wrestles just like he did. Uh, he just is really the outstanding man in wrestling for 15 years. You think maybe that looking back over the shoulder is a rumor that Coach started himself to get those kids on their toes? Uh, there's a lot of ways that coaches try to get athletes to win. But here are the opponents for those men at 167 and 190 pounds for Iowa. Two more All-Americans. Yes, I think that uh, Kistler from Iowa is now moving up to 167. This will be an interesting match against uh, his opponent. And, of course, we're all looking forward to the rematch with Goldman and Shade. Now, everybody knows, you keep telling me, that you've got to go out and win those first one or two matches. What's going to happen tonight? Well, Iowa hasn't had very good luck uh, so far at 118, 126. They just have been inconsistent. So they've had a couple of weeks to work on it. be interesting to see what they're doing now. What happens if Iowa wins those first uh, couple of matches? Uh, they could be real tough on Oklahoma. They have a lot of balance. You ever, have you ever been wrong? <laughs> Lots of times. <laughs> These Iowa-Oklahoma matches are always dogfights, and we'll see how it develops after we relive a 10-year memory from 1981 when an Iowa freshman tangled with an Oklahoma State NCAA champion. The 11-9 with 30 seconds left. at Carver Hawkeye Arena in Iowa City, Iowa for the duel between the Oklahoma Sooners and the Iowa Hawkeyes. You see that both teams are undefeated this year and their lineups tonight are full of power as you might expect. We're not quite sure he's going to go at 118 for Oklahoma yet. We'll see when he gets on the mat. Melchior and Egelin, two place winners last year. Neville and Randall at 134. You see Dresser ranked second in the country at 42. Top ranked people at 150. In the upper weights, it's Alger and Johnson. There's LaViolette against Kistler, Ryan against Ciparelli, Chade or Deaton against Goldman, and Tatum against Heyman at the heavyweight. So those are the lineups tonight for Oklahoma Sooners. They rank number four. There's Phil Henning and Iowa 
ranked number one. Phil Henning, the wrestling coach at Marshalltown High School, is the referee tonight, and we had a chance to ask him what he had in mind as he prepares to referee between these two fine teams. As a referee, I plan on calling this match much like any referee in Iowa would. The takedowns and the reversals, I won't give the points until after control is achieved past reaction time. Likewise, on the one-point escape, there will be loss of control past the reaction time. Near falls, I'll give them fast. On the stalling, a man is backing up to avoid contact, is not trying to improve his position basically in any situation, whether it's on the feet or down on the mat. Then there'll be a warning for stalling and subsequent penalties if they will not wrestle. Here we go, and it's Tony Belli wrestling for Oklahoma. He's a junior from Schenectady, New York, against John Regan, a freshman at Iowa. In the red, it's Oklahoma, the Sooners, and in the black and gold, the Iowa Hawkeyes ranked number one in the country. Two undefeated teams here in our second week of college wrestling. Chuck, should be a good one. Yes, I think that we're going to be interested in watching this match. Belli is a two-time national junior college champion has a lot of things that he does, but he tends to work more off of your offense than he does on offense on his own. He tends to be sort of a counter wrestler. He does have a fair duck under. And one of the things that we're looking for out of John Regan, Coach Gable and I talked, uh, he just has not been very intense to start this year. He's that spark plug that they'd like to get going. He had a lot of intensity when he first came to Iowa when he was redshirted, but he just hasn't been on the move so far this year. And so if that plays out, Doug, I think we'll see Reagan trying to generate more offense, and that may fall right into the hands of how Belli wrestles. The first period is three minutes long, as you probably know. The second period is two. The third period is two. They start on their feet here. Now you see Belli in. He got the high leg pickup from the outside, countered by uh, Regan of a, of a wizard, but he couldn't hold it. Take down for two. Oklahoma gets the first blood. He wrestles a little tentative. And that's one of the reasons why that takedown was good by Belli from Oklahoma. Reagan gave that up a little more than he needed to. No. Out of bounds with a minute and 43. They're, they've wrestled just a bit over a minute here in the first period. First takedown was given to Oklahoma's Tony Belli. Well, he didn't just, he wasn't given it. He went and got it. Yes, that's a, probably one of those things where they wrestle through about a minute. He feels out the other man isn't going to generate enough offense, so he took it on his own and scored. And now Reagan really has his work cut out for him. Of course, he just released him right there for an easy yeah. point. As soon as he began to get to his feet, Bell, I let him go. So we're back in the original position again. This time, a shot by Regan. Another shot by Regan. He has the same move on Belli that, that took him down a while ago, that high single. Now, Belli has his wrist controlled. So he took that wrist away from him so he doesn't have both hands on the leg. And defended himself there and got out of that. And Regan couldn't score. Well, I got the takedown with that move, that high single. We have now a minute and about five seconds to go in the first period. Two to one, Oklahoma. Warning, Tony Belli leading. Warning, Oklahoma, warning, warning against Belli. A warning from Phil Henning. You can hear him, he has a microphone. We saw Belli back out of there the first several times they wrestled and he received the warning for not wrestling in. Right in the center of the mat here at Hawkeye Carver Arena. Iowa against Oklahoma, two undefeated teams. I'll tell you, these Oklahoma has looked forward to this meet for a while. Yes, they're going to need these first couple of weights. Circle. As I mentioned uh, in the opening, it's important Circle. for them to get these where they have a chance because Iowa has so much balance. If they don't, they'll get, it's not inconceivable that Iowa could just smoke them in this duel. Regan was not able to get penetrate well enough to come Sun through with what circle on the edge next time it's a high crotch or a fireman's carry or some kind of a move he's unable to move belli there either so with 20 seconds to go he still trails two to one you just saw his coach abel point at his finger out what he was doing was telling his wrestler you wrestle in the center of that mat or you're going to get called for stalling just a few seconds left five seconds to go in the first period, two to one in favor of the man in red, Oklahoma's Tony Bella. Well, both men made one offensive effort. That's not enough to satisfy either down. coach, I'm sure. Regan had a choice here in the first, second in the second period, what he wanted to do. He could have put off the choice and said, let the other man make it. I'll take my choice in the third period. 
There's the Tom man who tonight is trying for an Iowa record. If he wins tonight, it's more wins than any Iowa coach has ever had. Dan Gable. And so Belli on top can't prevent Reagan from coming up, but he can put him back down again. He's getting up that arm, and this is a this is a bad spot for young John Reagan from Iowa. To let that arm, that base get taken away from him. No, 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 no. Right Still down. The last time after the takedown that Regan got in that position, as soon as he began to get to his feet, Bell, I let him go. But he's hanging a little tougher on him now. His coach has just come out to the edge during that break and told him, you break him down, get him down on the mat, and keep him down there. Regan made a good first move. He's back around. And he turned right in and got that leg, so Bell, I did release him back. And out. Now, two to two. So far, all we've seen is each wrestler make one offensive effort. It's going to be critical now that somebody gets going, and I think it's probably Belli from Oklahoma. And he's going to get called for stalling. Well, Regan is in on the high leg again. He's trying to use the edge. Looks better this time. He's taking his time, Doug. There he is. He got it. He's Four to two, Regan ahead. It's a big change in this crowd. He brought the crowd alive. Well, that's what they need. That's what we were talking about earlier. They need that spark plug in those first couple of weight classes. Okay, bottom end set. Let's go. We'll set up again with less than a minute, just about a minute to go in the second period. That's Tony Belli. He has more wins than losses this year, but that's about it there. I think they really expected more out of him. He's out right away, though. Three for Belli after the escape. It's four to three. Now, this time he did penetrate deep in on that single again. He has a leg up, and it's a matter of patience now in position. Two, takedown. Weights in the hands. There it is. The weight's on the hands, and it's a takedown for Belli. He's up now by one. Five to four. They're in the scramble that Reagan probably likes more than... Uh, Belli does. This is the kind of action that he wants. Let's see it again. Now he has the leg up, and it's a matter now of position. He wants to keep his arms in. He wants to keep that leg up. Now, as soon as he can make his opponent put his hands on the mat and support weight, then he'll receive the points. There they are. And there's the weight down on the hands. All right, we're coming back into the center again. Riding time you might be interested in. It's 40 seconds for Belli. Now, Reagan needs to fight this position a little better. He needs to be able to control that wrist, put pressure down on that leg. It's tied again. The riding time did not reach one minute for Belli. That's the magic point where it becomes worth a point at the end of a match. Five, five. Second period at Iowa City. Well, Belli still has his back to the outside. He's going to have to generate offense here, and the referee will get on him. He didn't get the heel pick that he was reaching for there. And also didn't get out of position. The same thing happened to Regan then. End of the period. Nobody apparently wanted to make a mistake at the end of the period. So it's 5-5. Riding time in favor of Belli, 53 seconds. And now you find out what they're made of. This third period is what makes champions. And it's Regan's turn up. It's interesting, both athletes, when they had their choice, decided to take that down spot yep. to try to score the point. Good quick move by Belli. He can just let it go. And now it's 6-5 in favor of Belli. You can anticipate that Belli is going to have to get on the offense. Even though Reagan isn't doing a lot, he's the aggressor. He's the guy that's making the offensive move in. A warning. Now that has to be a point. That's a point. It's now 6-6. Well, that's... Just shows what you were saying. He's the man who's been warned, and so he has to stay busy. Well, he's only made two offensive efforts that have really amounted to anything, and he's got the leg both times. So he needs to get back to that kind of offense. Reagan's staying right in his face. Reagan didn't make a move. You can see Stan Abel is on the side saying, go, go, make a try, make a try, Bella. You don't want to see your athlete lose a match based on not on inactivity, and that's so far as what happened. Now, they're right on the edge of the mat, too. They seem to get over there very quickly. How much time we have? A minute and five. There's the coaches from Oklahoma encouraging their athlete to go ahead and go. You see, he's not clearing the arms out of the way. He stopped him for a headgear adjustment. Look at the clock. Exactly a minute left to go in this match. It's 6-6. 
And right in time to be a matter if Belli could ever get back on top again. And has it penetrated through Reagan's hand? Reagan has the high single again on the right side, on the edge of the mat. And it's a matter of patience. Just have to be able to have be patient. He's got him in a good spot. Just has to be patient in order to score. And Eight to six in favor of Regan at the 30-second mark. Out of bounds. And the crowd is alive again in Carver. You know, he, he has the leg, and now what he needs to do is get good position. Stay up, make sure that man puts weight down on his hands. Bella is not fighting this nearly as effective as he did early. And Reagan is going to score the two points, and the problem is he's more fatigued now. He's tired. Now they're back at it again. In the center. And Belli has to go after Regan with just 30 seconds to go. Warning against Iowa. Out of bounds. Time is a factor. He gets scored a point for an escape, so it's 8 to 7. And 8 to 7, to Iowa. Iowa. So now if Belli gets a takedown, he'll win. Reagan keep, keep him away from that one. But Regan got in on the leg before Belli did, and this is where it's going to end. Oh, close, but no cigar. The battle to the wire. And I'll tell you, it matters. That first match matters, and Iowa wins it. No riding time. It's 8-7, to seven, Regan over Belli, and Iowa leads 3 to nothing. Well, we were talking about what's liable to happen. This now Oklahoma has to win this one, in your opinion. Yes, this is a must match for him. And this is a replay of a match that occurred last year in the national tournament. Oklahoma's Joe Melchiori against Matt Eglin of Iowa. Melchiori got it on the leg, but couldn't keep it. At 126, Melchiori in the red, a sophomore, a tremendously talented young man. Matt Eglin, a senior from Des Moines Dowling who finished second in the NCAAs last year, Melchiori fourth, and they met in the semis. Yes, Reagan in that match, uh, excuse me, uh, in that match, Mel Curry was winning five to one. And right near the end of the match, Mel Curry was reversed to his back and they going to end up winning six to five. They're in a real scramble here. Both men are just like little cats. They were both at 118 last year. Oh, oh, boy. Both up. Well, that's what Mel Curry likes to do. He likes that upper body, and he'll try to get Eglin from Iowa to wrestle in the upper body position if he can. Oklahoma in the red. This is, this is where he wants to be. Mel Curry from Oklahoma prefers this spot. He's got a lot of experience in international style, and he wants to get Eglin up. Oh. Eglin needs to be he here, down low. He just hand. walked into that single leg. He just walked into it, and Eglin has it. Now the question is, can Melchiori fight off the single leg move? Well, Eglin has to improve his position if he wants to be successful. He's got to improve it and get up with it. And when they went off the edge of the mat, Melchiori was in the better position. A minute 37 to go. Iowa 3, Oklahoma nothing after one match. We're at 126. In on the single leg again goes Eglin. This time he has a little better situation. They're in the center of the mat. A counter by Melchiori, and he got two out of it. Nicely done. That's one that we are more inclined to see from Rico Ciparelli from Iowa. And he just countered it by sitting his weight right underneath Eglin. He kept the whizzer, used his leg to elevate his opponent right on over top. And now he's tough on a cross face, Doug. If he can get this thing secure. Potentially dangerous on the knee. Yes, what they can't do is take that heel outside of the man's hip. I mean, he started to pick it up with his leg. And here you see Eglin in deep. He just sets down, puts his weight right underneath him, and lifts with the leg that Eglin has up. Scores the two-point takedown. Teach you never to, be, uh, never to be too secure about where you are in that situation. Here comes Melchiori. Put himself there. Put riding himself on there. top. No points. Well, he jammed the arm hard and then tried to tip his man toward his back, and Eglin wisely went right on through it. Tough rider. Well, he has the leg locked up with his leg, and then has the hip under control. What Eglin has to do is free that leg first in order to be able to 
gain uh, some type of uh, freedom of his lower body. 40 seconds left in the three minute first period. Now this is a hold he likes. He likes to come up over the head. He's got the leg locked up. And what he'll try to do is pull Eglin's head in toward him in a kind of a choke hold. And Eglin asks for a little time, two point near fall. Yes, what they do now is if a man has a potential pinning situation that can turn into a pinner, the referee, when, he, when the man breaks it, the referee gives the man on top the two point and then breaks it. So it's the same as if he took him to his back and then he was injured. So Eglin is now down four to nothing. And Oklahoma, as Chuck Patton suggested, needs to get at least one of these first two matches. Now Melchiori is trying to put the Sooners back in business again with only 15 seconds to go in the first period. Well, now Curry's hanging back a lot on the leg. You see he has a leg locked up to his leg and he's down below the hip. The referee has heard him start to count and he was counting to make sure that the man from Oklahoma moved up and got up off that low level right. Melchiori at the end of the period, four to nothing in favor of Melchiori. And I'll tell you, he was tough on top. He had a minute and 21 seconds of riding time. Choice went to Melchiori. And he deferred, so now it's Eglin's going to make his decision, I believe. Eglin got his choice. He decides to go on his feet. Well, they wrestled in the Midlands, and Melchiori won that match and didn't have a real struggle with it. So he may be wrestling without more confidence right now than Eglin is. Now he's in what's called the two-on-one tie you can see very easily two arms on one of Eglin's now he drops into a double leg and wham two more points well he took his leg and stepped around Eglin's leg on the same side he had the two on one just let his body drive Eglin right on over as Eglin was trying to pull out of it his weight went back on his heel and then Mel Curry could step on in on that and that's quiets the crowd if John uh, Regan's victory woke him up at uh, 118 Joe Melchiori's performance here has quieted everybody down again. Here's a little uh, quick timeout for Melchiori. I think he got a uh, finger in the eye. And he's on the edge of the mat waiting to recover. In the red shirt there, the red sweater, you see Lanny Davidson. You don't see his face, but he was a, an assistant coach for Dan Gable. And then he left and went down to LSU. And uh, they ended up there for a couple of years and then moved over to Oklahoma and now he's working with Coach Abel. One of a number of fine coaches who've worked with Dan Gable over the last few years. Referee Phil Henning says 40 seconds were used in that injury timeout. He gets 20 all the time. Head bump apparently. They bumped heads. That seems to be what happened. Melchiori comes back on top leading 6-0 over Egeland with a minute and a half to go in the second period. He dropped in low on that ankle, and there's a real nice move by Eglin to just turn himself right back inside. Reversal. Six to two. You saw Eglin turn around and look to his coaches and take his thumb and put it up and say, do you want me to let him up? He must have said no because he's gone right to work on that arm. Now they, they figured now's the time to put it to Melchiori if he can. Well, Eglin won a, a match last year in the, in the Nationals, as I was saying earlier by coming on strong late. And he was behind and then ended up beating Mel Curry. So maybe this is the start of his move toward what I'm sure the coaches want him to do, and that's wrestle with intensity. Phil Henning puts them together again with 105 to go in the second period. A lot of riding time. As a matter of fact, uh, still over a minute for Mel Curry. He's trying to go into that short sit, and there he throws a grand he out. A counter. It, but it all came out the same and escaped for Melchiori. Well, it was a nice series of moves. Melchiori threw the Granby, Eglin stepped over, Melchiori rolled on through with it. On the edge of the mat. Now, nope. Eglin tried to do that uh, outside carry, but he swept too far out and away from his opponents that in underneath him. So now he's locked up under in not very good position. Stalemate. Phil Henning brings it back to the center. Neither man can improve his position. Seven to two is the score in favor of Melchiori of Oklahoma. His team trails three to nothing. Iowa's Regan won at 118 pounds, eight to seven over Belli. 
Well, this is a spot Mal Curry prefers. Eglin's doing most of the wrestling right now. Mal Curry's more or less kind of standing in here, but you see him block that knee. Now, if he can get past his opponent with his hip, he has a chance. He could. Eglin blocks him out with that. But he's still in bad position. His head's down, his arms are extended. He's got to get out of this position and hold it until the end of the period and does. And he does, so no points are scored. There's Greg Randall getting ready to go next to the 134 against Nick Neville for Iowa. Hey, Seven to two, Oklahoma's choice. Melchiori goes down. He's leading by five, and he hopes to be out of here right now. Eglin couldn't hold him the one time he had him in a reversal, after a reversal. Well, he's sitting tight over his ankle, so Eglin can't pick him up. Eglin now has the arm, and this is one of those places where they try to get those little tilts, but this is where Mel Curry wants to be, out in that short sit, fighting on the hands, and then he'll try to throw that Granby. You saw him try to tuck his head. Now he's holding the wrist so he can get the Granby if he can. Now here- Eglin trying to crank on him, but he got too high, and that's it. He didn't have enough pressure down on the outside arm. It's eight to two. Came in with an arm too high, got pitched right on past. 10 to two now, it's a major decision at this point and we're marking we're marking uh, riding time seconds again it's over a minute well they were both 18 pounders last year and, and so far it looks to me as if uh, mal curry has made the adjustment up to 126 with a little more power and stamina than eglin has he's definitely in control here the only points eglin's had were a reversal in the middle of the second period see he's got one arm tied up with the wrist and his pressure is way out on eglin's head very little eglin can do here and i would imagine that in a short period of time, he's either going to try to run it around or the referee's going to call him for, for stalling on top. 50 seconds to go in the match. Melchiori has an eight-point lead and a lot of riding time. There he got the wrist free. Now he has a chance to get his upper body up and get started. Get oh, tilt. I don't know if the referee was in position for that. Nobody says back points, no. Nope. He was just on the wrong side of it. By the time he got around, Eglin was out of it, but that's close. Those are the kind that beat you in the Nationals. They're so easy, so so almost cheap, that they win for you. Now, now he's got him on now his Now we back. are gonna get back points because Melchiori has Eglin in a bad spot with 10 seconds to go. It's gonna be a three-point near fall, and maybe a pin. Boy, that got him be... stretched out. He's gonna be able to keep the shoulder up, I think. A three-point near fall and riding time. And that'll make it 14 to two. So it's a superior decision. That's a five-point run for Oklahoma. A successful match for Joe Melchiori at 126 pounds over Matt Egeland of Iowa State. And the team score is now Oklahoma five and Iowa three. 134 pounds. So I'm sure the Hawks hope to do better at that weight than they did. Yes, I don't think they were satisfied at all. Here goes Nick Neville against Greg Randall of Iowa. And in comes Neville of Oklahoma at 134, a junior from Dallas, Texas, immediately on the leg. You see Randall got good pressure down with that wizard. He's going to try to keep his man below him. Doesn't want to keep his head down. He's going to lose it if he keeps his head down. He doesn't have the angle. Neville from Oklahoma just lost the angle and he got out of that position. Randall did with uh, good ability. But Neville came right out at the opening whistle and he forced it right away. That's 30 seconds that Randall wasn't able to work on it. They want to take away Randall's ability to shoot. He's, he's working a lot harder this year at being able to keep himself in good position. He spent some time in the off season working on his technique. And uh, they're going to try to take that away from him, his ability to go. He's a real shape wrestler. In the third match, Oklahoma against Iowa at Iowa City. Top-ranked Hawks against number four, Oklahoma. And it'll be Iowa-Penn State next week. Penn State's ranked number two. We're getting to see all the best on our 10th anniversary college wrestling season on Iowa Public Television. That's Oklahoma's Nick Neville on the left. He's from Dallas, Texas. Not a lot of great wrestlers come out of Texas, but this is a quick young man. He's got a pretty good single. You saw him open with it. You saw him shoot half of it right there. He didn't penetrate it all the way in, but that's basically his move is that single. He'll try to get you to do a little bit of low 
wrestling here where he doesn't do a lot, and then all of a sudden he'll pop that single in on you quick. And of course, Randall wants to get him off of that. He wants to keep him up high. But uh, you see, Neville's a hands-on wrestler too. He wants to work right in close. He wants to get hold and, and tie. Well, he knows that, that Randall has real good stuff from the outside. He, he tends to want to make his moves come from the position where he's not in, in contact with his opponent. So Neville's trying to take away his offense by tying him up, keeping his hands on it. And Randall hasn't been able to make a, an offensive move yet. We're up two minutes into the three-minute first period. And there's no score in this match. Randall, Greg Randall's just up the road at Mount Vernon. You see Randall reach out with his hand like he wants to tie up. Warning then both men. Warning, you, both men. Both warning both against both men, both men here. Both right. Both. Neither man has really penetrated anybody. Just hasn't made the offensive move. That's Kathy Gable, Dan's wife, and uh, she. Her face, I think, shows the score here. Zero, zero, nothing in there. She's not committing anything at all until something happens here from one man or the other. Phil Henning has said, in effect, what you're doing now isn't working. Let's try something else. And they haven't done it yet. Right, and you see Neville getting in close, keeping his man tied up, taking away Randall's offense. And when they start against, it's my, my guess that Randall will try to reach his hands out toward his opponent, doesn't really want to grab a hold of him and stay there. So Neville just comes inside and gets a hold of him. So Randall isn't free to go ahead and work his offense. Now when we start the second period in this match, it's gonna be uh, Randall's choice to do what he wants, to pick the position. You hear Phil Henning saying edge, edge. If one man has his back to the edge and they're very close to the edge, the other man is supposed to let him in. What Randall has is such great balance. He is a real a balanced wrestler. First period, no score. Randall's choice. You just heard Gable come out to the edge and say to his athlete, you're tied up too much. All right. Randall wants to stay on his feet, as if he wants to say, OK, we're going to settle this. I'm going to prove to this guy that I can score on him up here. They saw him push out that time. You know, just kind of pushed his opponent away. He wants to be there. And if Neville attacks him, what he prefers is with his good balance is to have Neville attack him between the knee and the hip. Once he gets him up around the knees and the hips, up and there, that's where Randall wants him. I know for, for many first-time wrestling viewers or people who haven't been around the sport a long time, this gets to be kind of confusing. Yes. Why are these people putting their hands on each other and nothing seems to be happening? Why aren't we seeing all these rushes across the ring with the, the way those pros do it? <laughs> they make it look like you can just grab a guy's arm and yeah. take it and put it behind his back. It just isn't quite that easy when the other man doesn't want it to happen. Well, it's now one-to-one -one because Henning says stalling again both ways, and this time it's a point for both people. One-to-one. -one. The coach from Oklahoma, Abel, has just told his athlete, go on, get in there. Now get in there. Now, what you got to do is make sure that his shots stay low. There is a point against Randall for stepping back, and it's now Neville 2 and Randall 1. Well, the shots from, from uh, Neville from Oklahoma have to be low on Randall. He can't afford to come in there on that thigh because that's where Randall can use that balance and use his hips. Edge of the mat. See Gil Coach Gable saying, you can't get in that. Don't get in that. Get your arms back in front. Don't keep those elbows up high like that. See Randall trying to stay away a little bit. But Neville's a pesky rascal in the 30 seconds to go in the second period. Well, he got Randall called for stalling. It's really kind of a, a I'd say that it's sort of a mirage. You know, he, he, he was making some half efforts, but really hadn't penetrated any of them. You know, hadn't really made the effort to go on in there. Back to the center with only 18 seconds to go in the second period. Oklahoma leads in the meet, five to three, on a big win by Joe Melchiori over Egoland at 126. And here we are at 134, and Neville leads two to one over Randall of Iowa. So if you call that a shot, that's exactly what he's been doing. Now here's where Randall prefers him. He wants him up in there where he can use that balance. 
Greg looks thoroughly frustrated after two periods. He isn't clearing Neville's arms out of his way. He's just not getting him out of the way so he can make his low-level attack. Now, Neville, Neville starts, gets his choice this time, and we'll see what he wants to do. He picks down, thinks he can score from here. This is a strong suit for Randall. He's good at taking away those arms and being able to chop a man down, cut him to his side, get those hip tilts. But Randall, uh, Randall does trail by one, so he's going to have to be satisfied quickly that he can make points down from the top position. Well, he has the arm tied up. This is where he prefers to be. He's got to stay in behind his arms, though. He spun him down there. Hear the crowd, they're trying to get Neville call for Stalin for crawling off the mat. That's Stan Abel. He just said, show me something. Talking to his man, encouraging him to go ahead and get that point. And immediately, three to one. Nice little hip heist. Looked like a switch, but really didn't intend to get the leg. He just wanted to move his leg through so that Randall couldn't take it, land on his hand, pop his hips through. There'll be no riding time here, but Randall has to pick Neville down to get a tie right now. And that stalling point earlier was critical, Doug. Well, the next one is two points. So Randall doesn't dare get into that kind of shoving match that they've been in for two periods. He has his back to the edge. He doesn't want to be here. It's a matter of interpretation now. There's that balance he likes. Trying to really force it with the wizard. He couldn't make anything of it on the edge. There's Reagan working to get his weight down. The coaches just came out and they broke right near their corner and told Neville from Oklahoma, if you shoot five times, you'll win. Oklahoma leads five to three. Regan got a three-point decision for Iowa. Melchioria, five points, the barrier decision for Oklahoma. And there's some good people coming up from both sides in the next two matches. This is a big match because Iowa expects to win it. But yes, Randall, they do. Randall's behind by two points with 40 seconds to go. Well, the man from Oklahoma has already made two of those efforts his coaches asked him to make. Was They said five in the next minute, you'll win it. And there's, even though it wasn't successful, it was a show-me effort. Keeps the referee off his back. Remind you, too, that later in the telecast, after 150 pounds, we'll show you a special 10th anniversary off the mat. A look at Lou Bannock, Olympic gold medalist. He's now a lieutenant in the Army. But right here, Randall is trying to come from behind. He's down three to one against Nick Neville of Oklahoma with only that many seconds up there left. He's got to make some effort. He's going to call in for Stalin, I believe. Both men. But that's two points for Neville. Randall for Stalin, two points for Neville. And that makes it five to two, and we haven't had anything but penalty points and, and escapes. Really the first low-level attack he made, and it was too late. And that's it for riding time. That's a big win for Oklahoma. Nick Neville, five, and Greg Randall, two. Coaches Greg from Randall. Iowa cannot be happy with that match. No, it's a very frustrating match for Randall. It's only his fourth loss of the, well, his fourth loss of the season in 15 matches. And there, Stan Abel has got to be feeling pretty good. He's got his team up eight to three here in Iowa City. Score, Oklahoma, eight, Iowa, three. Now it's Keith Walton of Oklahoma against Kevin Dresser, ranked number two in the country in the black uniform from the University of Iowa. Dresser's lost only once this year. And he has uh, been a one tough hombre. Yes, he's had a real good start so far. His only loss was to a non-collegian, so he's just been wrestling very well. And, and probably uh, because Randall was the man that wanted to take that spot, that 142-pound spot, and he had to get ready for this year, so he's in a little better shape. And you know, Doug, that may be a factor in, in Randall's conditioning, too. He had to go down because he couldn't beat out Dresser. So now he's 
the man that's at this weight, Dresser, and he's in good shape. He's wrestling confidently and uh, has really made himself one of the best guys in the country. Beat last year's national champion, 134, by 12 points. You Dresser see, has made the shots here. Right, you see him making those outside shots. There he is on the leg again now. He got to it. He's going right to the back point immediately. <laughs> like that's what you like to see is get out there and go after him. And he's got the arm tied up. Got him real tight. This is what Iowa needs. This is what they needed to get him started. He's got those arms so tight. He's going to pin him out of here. He did it. A big win. win for Iowa. A pin just when things were looking a little dark. That's right. Well, once he went on that leg and he hooked it, he came right up to the arm and caught that arm that came back, tipped his man, stepped over top him, had those arms so tied up. And he went right to it. It wasn't, well, I'll take him down and then in a few minutes I'll think about turning him over. Here, now watch you. He's got the arm tight. Now he's going to use Walton's arm to take him to his back. He just stepped over with the arm trapped by his hip. Now he comes back out, both arms tight, so tight. There's no way he can get those arms out of there, and it's a matter now just if can he lift his head up and break his bridge. You can see his shoulder's flat. Right there, he's flat just right now. Even though he slapped it later, he is flat for the second. 150 pounds coming up. It's Iowa 9 now, Oklahoma 8. A big win, a pin by Kevin Dresser. Well, you know, in a tough match, so it's if you have trouble getting started, you need something big to happen. And Kevin Dresser made it happen. Now we have number one ranked Jim Heffernan against number five ranked Darren Higgins of Oklahoma. Heffernan on the right. I recall watching this young man from Oklahoma last year in one of our telecasts. The coaches from Oklahoma had told me that down there, they call him the force of funk. <laughs> because just when you think you got him, he gets you. So with Hefferman, a real solid wrestler that stays in good position, it'll be interesting to see if he can get some of the things he likes to do. There's Hefferman on the outside, single on the right. He's going over to the other side for the bar star and uh, wasn't able to get it. Now he goes up high to the single. It's good balance. Higgins has real good balance. He's third in the Nationals last year. He didn't get there by luck. You see him fight for that wrist and stay in balance. He's been taken down almost a number of times, but not quite. There's the two. And there's the takedown. Two to nothing in favor of Pepperdine. That's Randy Lewis who's doing color on the radio broadcast now. Here now he's, he's got the leg and is, he can break the wizard. There he broke the wizard forced his man to turn back to it and got the two-point takedown. Two to nothing in favor of Heffernan over Darren Higgins of Oklahoma. It's Iowa 9, Oklahoma 8 after 142 pounds. Higgins is out. It's one for him against two for Heffernan. It was a little short sit out. He realized he was starting to lose position. The headgear came off, but he already had his arm up over top for the escape. Stop for a little uh, adjustment of the hat here. Headgear on Heffernan came loose. Well, I think what's happened is that Higgins has gone a long way on just natural ability, great balance, good hips. And what the coaches there are trying to teach him now is to maintain better position so that he can not uh, play off the other man's offense, but have an offense of his own. Yeah, you can win a lot of matches as a counter man, but you don't win national championships that way. It's very difficult. And there's Heffernan in, but there's that quick reactions and balance to pull Higgins out of there. They're on the edge of the mat now. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Phil Henning calls him back to the center, and he does. Nine to eight. Iowa up on a fall by Kevin Dresser over Keith Walton in the first period of the 142. Well, we saw Heffernan make most of the offense there early, and it'll be interesting for all the fans to, to know, I think, that uh, 
Heffernan last year was a little hesitant when he started out in the year. Yes. And he, he remained undefeated for quite a period of time. And this year, an early season loss has kind of put him on more intensity early, and he's not trying to protect an undefeated record. He's go ahead and wrestle. Oh, he almost caught uh, Higgins in a pancake there coming in. Now he got the single on the outside. Looked like he was going to take everything, and he took one away. Couldn't hold it. It's no score there. Heffernan still leads 2-1. to one. And he has been the aggressor. 25 seconds to go in the first period. Heffernan of Iowa in the black uniform against Higgins of Oklahoma. Higgins has not been able to break through uh, Heffernan's defense. Hands are always the first line of defense and arms are next. And he just hasn't been able to clear Heffernan out of the way. See, he tried to sit through there, but the hands were on him. Now he gets through it. So he nice gets move. underneath it. Nice reaction. Oh, that's about as good as you can get on being able to react and counter. That was a big one for Heffernan because Higgins thought he'd made a great move at the end of the period, and it ended up a loss of two points. Without a response, you can't get an escape on it. Watch him come in. He's in deep. Now Heffernan just takes that throws it right on past him, slides his leg out, comes back in for the two-point takedown. Couldn't clear the arm, could he? Four to one is the score. There's Dan Gable. That made him happy. That's one of the you nicest bet. things to happen. He could be the winningest coach in Iowa history if he wins this meet tonight. <laughs> nice standing switch. <laughs> It's Heffernan by five, six well, to one. He did such a nice job there. He got to his feet, and then when Walton tried, or Higgins tried to put him down, he just hit a nice standing switch, came right out behind him for the reversal. Well, it's got to be frustrating for Higgins, and you wonder if he isn't thinking about that move at the end of the first period. When he, he had a good solid shot and lost it. No, he was putting his fist down on the mat with a little bit of frustration, so I'm sure that it hasn't left his mind. Six to two. Well, he got the escape, but he didn't move out right away. And here's Heffernan right back in on a leg. No escape. The referee says no escape. He wants to allow reaction time. And so he's saying this is the original position. So now watch him improve his position. You see him come up, work his way out on the heel, and then go back to the mat with a two-pointer. Or he, did, well, he didn't give any to start with, so it's still six to so one. Still six to one here in 150 pounds, second period. But he's tied up those arms, and now he has in a good chicken wing. If he gets out the side of this thing, he might be able to tip him. He's got him. He's trying to, trying to load him up here and get back points. He's got him up. He's getting back points. Referee's counting. Now he got a two-point near fall. Two near fall makes it eight to one. So and he gave up the arm again. Now Heffernan has that arm. Pulls it back to his side, and then he lets go, slides it into a chicken wing. Now he comes across and grabs it. Now watch him just tuck his hip under and roll him right on over top of that other arm. What he wants to do is just load him on his hip. There he comes. Gonna pull him with the chicken wing back toward his back for another near fall. Well, we have 15 seconds to go. This is also a two-point near fall. Now we're counting again. It could be a three. He has to keep him past 45 for five seconds. He hasn't been able to do it. There's two. The two referee waits until the, the near fall position is cleared before he counts up the points. All right, you can't get more than one near fall with the same position. So even though it looks like he improves back to his base, as long as he still has the chicken wing, he has to wait. I mean, there's a two competitive wrestlers here, but Heffernan has now racked up a 10 to one lead over Higgins, and he got four of them there on those tilts. I tell you, if you can tilt people, you can, you can just burn them. Today's style, the way they score points on back points, that's just what you gotta do. Heffernan is wrestling so much more aggressively than we saw him wrestle last year. I took the escape away, so the riding time is screwed up. Uh, it should be two minutes and 10 seconds riding time advantage Iowa, because there was 10 seconds advantage at the beginning of the period. He rode him for two minutes, so Iowa has 210 advantage. That's Phil Henning talking about riding time. I don't think we need to explain that any better than he did. And it was uh, sharp of him to recognize the, the problem. Two minutes, ten, seconds, right now. 10 to 1 in favor of Heffernan. There's a young man, Eglin, trying to get his weight back down for tomorrow. 
the next meet. Higgins and Heffernan. Oklahoma's man is down 10 to 1. He picks the bottom here. He wants to score something coming out from underneath, but the trouble was he got tilted twice at the end of the last period, and it looks like it could happen again. Well, he's, he hasn't given up the arm yet, but when Heffernan gets that arm and pulls it in, there he's got the arm pulled in. Now he's going to try to take those arms, see if he can't use them against him. This is what they call a spiral right. He's up high on the head, one arm down on the thigh, lets him go for one. Higgins' second escape. 10 to 2. The riding time, 2 minutes and 10 seconds for Heffernan. That's worth a point, too. It will not be taken away from him. He's got, he has enough to get a riding time point. 9 to 8 in favor of Iowa or Oklahoma or, or an injury as Higgins goes down. Well, hit in there awful deep on that double. When he was in on the double, then he started to twist his man. Injury timeout Higgins. And here comes Lanny. Davidson out and the Iowa trainer. It looks like he got ribs or something. Tonight's attendance. Five well, he had the double very deep. Once he had the double, his shoulder was in t right into those ribs. Let's Here, see take a look at it. Here, see him hit in double now. His left shoulder is right up in the ribs. When he starts to twist, his shoulder drives right into the ribs. I thought maybe he hurt the knee when he chopped that knee down, but it looks like the shoulder hit in the ribs. Maybe hurt a cartilage in there. Darren Higgins. Who's had his hands full tonight with Jim Heffernan. Heffernan 10, Higgins 2, actually 12 to 2 after that uh, takedown. In the second half. On which he was hurt. He has more than his hands full, Doug. He's getting thrashed on right here. Heffernan is ranked first. You can see why he's extremely experienced. Only a junior, too. And this is a young man that was third in the Nationals last year, so you can get an idea of the quality of match Heffernan's wrestling. Dan Gable. 160 wins as an Iowa coach. Tonight could be 161. That would be a record. There are the people ahead of him. Look at those losses. Is that significant? <laughs> Six losses. Boy. That's amazing. And of course, Dave McCuskey was a successful coach up at, at what was then Iowa State Teachers College for quite a number of years, too, before he went to Iowa. Now, uh, Higgins insists that he's ready to start. He's going to come out and give it a try. He has a minute and 20 seconds to catch Heffernan or do something. He's down by 10 points. He's not going to catch him. He's going to be lucky if he doesn't get 15 pointed. Sits Got that up. little short sit out, but Heffernan just cuts him loose on it. It's 12 to 3 now. Higgins third escape. He's well, he has a one chance to win this match, Doug, and that's to get into something that's Funk. You know, that's exactly yeah. the only way we can call it. He's got to get in where Heffernan makes a mistake and then he thro throws it. Heffernan's wrestling too well. Or is this Heffernan? Oh! That's what happened. You're trying something that puts you out of position. Here's a chance for another pin. He's got him in a bad spot if he can keep that pressure up toward the head. Three a three point near fall. It's 17 to 3 now with 30 seconds to go. Heffernan cuts him loose. Eight. 17 to 4. Riding time. Well, I'll tell you what's happening. Phil Henning's coming over and he's saying 14. Oklahoma gets a one point escape. They're both on their feet. Yeah, he knows very well there's going to be a 15 point differential if there were riding time, but you can't count the riding time until after the match is over. One takedown now, however, will end it. But Dan Gable still over at the uh, bench talking about it. If Heffernan gets a takedown here in the last 30 seconds, that's it. Same as a pin. The technical fall, 15 points difference. Well, he huh. slipped the headlock there. Higgins got it. 17-6. It's a nice little hip high roll right out of there. 18-6. Still a superior decision. Uncontested Heffernan from Iowa in this match. There's the coaches that don't want him to sit on it. They want him to get this. Well, if he gets a takedown, he can still make a technical fall out of it. We're at the end. 
and it didn't happen. But with, with riding time, it's 19 for Jim Heffernan, ranked number one, and six for Darren Higgins of Oklahoma. And these last two matches, between Dresser and Heffernan's matches, have put Iowa back out in front. That's five for the Hawks. Makes it 14 to eight over Oklahoma. There's the score after 150 pounds at Iowa City's Carver Hawkeye Arena. Iowa Hawkeyes 14, Oklahoma 8. Didn't start out that way, but that's the way it is now coming up to the last five matches. And boy, do we have a good schedule for you, we think, on Tuesday nights and a few weekends to come on college wrestling. Iowa and number two ranked Penn State next time. Then Iowa and Iowa State, which I think maybe some people think should be ranked number two. And followed by UNI Morgan State, and Iowa State, Oklahoma State later in January. In February, Wisconsin Lehigh from the East, Iowa State at the Unidome, Iowa, Oklahoma State on a Saturday, and UNI Drake, and then the rematch between the Cyclones and the Hawkeyes on a Sunday. Note that time, 5 o'clock p.m. in the afternoon on the 23rd. So, the big teams, and you notice how many of them are from Iowa. There are some good ones this year in those top ranked, top ranked Cyclones, um, Hawkeyes, Panthers are all good teams right up at the top. Now you're looking at Royce Alger, who will be up next in a rematch of the championship match at the Midlands against Johnny Johnson of Oklahoma. Now Johnson is ranked number two in the country, and Alger was unranked. That isn't going to be the same the next time the rankings come out because Johnson lost to Alger nine, I believe the score was nine to eight. But Johnny Johnson is a lucky young man to be wrestling again, I think, Chuck, because... Uh, Last year, he missed the entire season with a neck injury, a very serious vertebrae problem in his neck, and he was told, I think, by a couple of people that he probably just ought to forget the sport. They, they did sort of a minor arthroscopic type of surgery where they went and made an incision on the front, went through, and took out part of the disc and then let him fuse naturally. And he's back out here again, wrestling with confidence. It's Alger of Iowa in the black, who's had a terrific winner so far in wrestling in his sophomore year. Johnny Johnson, a junior from Midwest City. Well, you just saw Johnson use two times the move that he probably does best and that he gets in and then snaps you down. He gets you leaning on him a little bit and then he pops you down. He has a real hard crackdown. And of course, Alger is just a goer. He just loves to get in and uh, make a lot of pressure puts you in a position where you become a little defensive and you don't you're not thinking your offense you're thinking about defending yourself. Royce Alger a product of those longtime strong wrestling programs at Little Lisbon High School but Johnson gets the first take down. Did a nice job of blocking now he's got the arm tied up if he can twist him a little more and lift those hips he might be able to score a near fall point. Just, just no didn't points. quite no didn't quite get him over. Phil Henning said nothing, and it's two to nothing in favor of Johnson of Oklahoma. Watching Johnson pace around before this match, there's Stan Abel, his coach. He had the feeling that Johnson was really psyching himself up. He didn't like to lose. He's a definite winner. He came out with a lot, a lot of uh, freestyle wrestling in high school and was a real big name and then placed as a, a fifth in the national tournament when he was real young, and then, of course, the injury last year. Knocked him out of it. But now it's two to one. Alger escapes. That's the first point for him. Coming a minute and a half into the first period. Interesting to watch this match progress. Alger tends to burn himself a lot uh, early. You know, he gets himself in a position there. He's got the snap down, but he went right to the leg. He snapped him right down to the ankle, didn't he? This is Alger's very good in here. Johnson, of course, likes the upper body. So if they get there a lot, you're going to see somebody get tossed. Royce Alger in the black uniform, Johnson in the red. Saw so him make the effort. You know, he almost got past him. Critical in that position, Doug, is that a man gets his hip past the other man's hip. If he ever gets there, he's... Well, Johnson wanted to step in. Looked like he wanted to do the inside trip. Now he's just taking what they call that a front headlock. He just gets a man down underneath him and catches the chin. And Alger's got such good position, he maintained his hips under and didn't get pulled out of position. It's Iowa 14, Oklahoma 8 after five matches. We're at 158 pounds if you just joined us. 
I'm Doug Brown with Chuck Patton from Carver Hawkeye Arena on our college wrestling 10th anniversary season. Now here's where both men want to be in some of that upper body. Somebody gets tossed right there. Well, you have to stay alive up there. That's <laughs> you go to sleep half a second, and the next thing you know, you're looking at the lights. Well, it's a, pos it's a position where balance is critical. A nice, deep, penetrating high crotch for Alger. Got in good now. What he wants to do is be able to keep his arms in close to himself. He doesn't want to let that leg get out away from him. There he's going to drag right up there. He's able to kick the far leg out, and it's now three to two Alger, his first lead. Big move by Alger, fires the crowd up again. Now he's got the leg up, clears his head to the outside. He's going to take his foot and sweep and then drive through it when the man hops. Can't get that foot back out to replace it. Scores the takedown. Now we're back watching him again from the referee's position, with which Alger started on top with only a few seconds left to go in the first period. There's good block by the leg. And good he got hit. the point at the end of the match. Good move by Johnson. Ties it 3 3. You can't, you can't fault these guys for not going hard, can you? Well, I'll tell you. 3 3. Royce Alger, maybe the best wrestler ever to come out of Lisbon. It's hard to say. A couple other people would argue the point, but. Well, he's headed towards certain stardom. He keeps going like this with high quality men like Johnson. Two minutes to go in the second period as we start. It's a two minute period. It was uh, Johnson's choice. He's on top. Holding on to the ankle. I'm sure Phil Hung's going to get him off of that pretty quick. Now he freed the ankle, but he tied up an arm. Now Johnson needs to move up with that leg. He's going to score an escape. Four to three. Alger takes the lead with that escape. But Johnson comes right back with two. He did a nice little step in with his foot, blocked Alger's foot, drove his hips on through. Now this is a tough spot. If he can lift the leg up and get his leg scissored underneath it, then he can use his leg to elevate Alger's hips. Drive him on over with that. There's nothing that the bottom man can do here. His leg is, is trapped in underneath that man on top. Until he frees that leg, can't go anyplace. Potentially dangerous this time. Phil Henning calls, uh, calls Johnson off it. Hawkeye fans a little concerned about their man. Everybody knew this match was going to be close. This is going to be a dog fight all the way. Johnson on top, driving with his weight down against Alger, but he can't keep him from standing up or turning. He wants to lift the hips now. He's got to free that leg that you see in his leg. He's got to be able to get that free out of there. Out of bounds. Let's look at the clock. A minute and one second to go. Riding time, it belongs to Johnson. He has a minute and 11 seconds worth. And he leads by one. Well, he's also ahead five to four, so he's trying to put some pressure. Now, see him move up toward the head, put pressure down. Alger does a good job of building his base, out, coming up for the point. Five to five after one point escape by Alger. There's a deep shot by Alger, just didn't free the arm. Now he comes right back in. Here's what we call a front headlock. This is to be successful. What Johnson has to do is extend his man out away from his base. He spins he in behind it. for the takedown. Importance again, a good position. That's right. And he wants to keep pressure on Alger now, keep him forward. See, Alger doesn't really want to step in behind that leg because it kind of ties him up. He's got one, his arm scissored with one leg, and he's trying to come in and tie up the arm and the head on the opposite side. Potentially dangerous. That's the Alger family there. And uh, tell you, it's tough life <laughs> being a parent of a wrestler when you're out against this kind of competition all the time. Seven to five, Johnson of Oklahoma leads over Royce Alger, and he has a lot of riding time as well as the lead. See Alger build up to his base right there. He's trying to get that one pointer. He did. Seven to six, we're still only in the second period. Now, those are tough ones to give up when a man scores right at the end of the period. Don't win national championships, giving up points with no time left. And now Johnson, who deferred his choice there, decided to take down. Well, he's ahead seven to six if he can score this point. Be in pretty good shape. 
Now Johnson's been able to take Alger down three times. Alger still has to convince Alger, uh, Johnson that he can score on his feet. There's a nice snap down attempt by Alger. Johnson's got to get back on the offense or Alger will take him down. 14 to eight, Oklahoma leads in the team score after five matches. The Sooners were coming back to the middle now with a eight to six lead for Johnson. There's Barry Davis, Olympic silver medalist and three-time national champion at University of Iowa. I see Johnson ties up tight, just kind of holding him in right there. The head and the arm, he's kind of holding his opponent in. If he can get him down under him, it takes away a lot of Alger's offense. Alger fights through it and is free. Now there's a good high crotch attempt. He's got a free back in on the leg. Outside single for Johnson fought it off. He's had good luck snapping him down even in, in, from defensive positions. Yes, he has. He hits that little crack down. Keeps the referee off his back also for yeah. warning him for stalling or penalizing him for stalling. Eight to six is the score. Johnson leads by two. That's the Oklahoma staff. Davidson on the left, Abel on the right. They're telling him, man, get inside. Don't let your elbow hang up high. Get inside. Again, he comes around. Doesn't have a chip. There it is. Ten to six in favor of Johnson. They have some good athletes, don't they, Doug? That's three takedowns on a counter by uh, Johnson, too, on, on moves which Alger initiated. Come on, let's go, Johnson! He had that one trip, but the other three of the four takedowns were on counter moves. Escape 10 to 7. Only 35 seconds to go in the match. Now watch this pressure coming in high here. He is taking away Alger's potential for offense by staying in this position, though. We've had no warnings yet for stalling. They've both been active. And they're both tired, that's for sure. They've been wrestling hard. Right in the center, and time is running out on Royce Alger. He got a takedown. <laughs> Ten to nine, but he he doesn't have riding time, so he has to crank the man over if he can. But he can. Riding time point goes to Johnson. He wins 11 to nine over Royce Alger and avenges his loss in the Midlands Championships. So Johnny Johnson sends his season record at 21 and three and pulls his team a little closer to Iowa. It's now the Hawks 14 and the Sooners 11 after 158 pounds. Well, I'm sure Stan Abel thought he was gonna get something better out of 42 and 50 or Oklahoma would definitely be trouble this time. They've wrestled well in those, these last couple of matches, that's for sure. It's 167 and last year's 158 pound national champion for Iowa, Marty Kistler, now up a weight, goes against the man who finished third in the NCAA at this weight last year, John LaViolette. LaViolette, with his back to you, is built very stocky, powerful wrestler. Well, what he'll do is he'll try to get Kistler to kind of have a slow start. He, he would prefer, if he could, to keep Kistler off him. Kistler hit that good outside single, and he's got the leg up, and LaViolette's trying to control the wrist to keep him from being able to be effective with it. See the lift by Kistler, but the, there's a good inside foot attack. But LaViolette is out, makes it 2-1. Two, two for the takedown for Kistler, and one for LaViolette's escape. I started to say LaVolet would like to have Kistler start slow. He doesn't want to have this match go real fast, and when he does go, he'll, he'll try to get a real good duck under. He's got a little pop where he sticks his head underneath and then drives his hips on in. Kistler can take that low-level attack to him. That's to his benefit. 14 to 11, Iowa leads by three. Now you see Iowa at 177 who should be favored with Chipparelli coming next against an inexperienced man. And then we had that big matchup at 190 unless Chade is not feeling well. And Tatum at heavyweight against a relatively inexperienced Iowa wrestler too. This is kind of, a, kind of a swing match for Oklahoma. He just got warned for stalling for inactivity. Yeah, LaViolette 
needs to win here. Oklahoma could uh, face trouble ahead. This match has potential to go either way, although I'd have to give the nod to Kissler now and what I've seen just because he's been the active man. He could get caught in some of that activity, but he's the man that's making the offensive effort. Kissler had a scramble that time to keep, to keep the violet from out there popping behind him. Well, he's making that high crotch attempt where he steps inside, reaches to the to the crotch with his arm, and uh, the Violet just pushed his arm by. We have 40 seconds to go in the first period. Kissler leads two to one. He got a single leg takedown very shortly after the beginning of the match. And he's made the offensive moves. That's right, and he's already, LaViola from Oklahoma has been warned for stalling. And he could get penalized here. He hasn't been doing very much. Well, these Iowa wrestlers have a, have a way of, of forcing their tempo on you. There's that little duck under right there, and he just got penalized. He got penalized, too. He made the duck under too late. I must say, this is about the, uh, the quietest I've seen Stan Abel at a, uh, in a way uh, against the referee <laughs> in a couple of years. He's, uh, he's either turned over a new leaf entirely or he's satisfied with the way Phil Henning is calling this match. So he hasn't been on him very much, no, has he? No, he hasn't. It's a tough meet here, 14 to 11, too. Iowa 14, Oklahoma 11. Kissler starts. On top, in the second, first period, it was his charge. The violet's very quick coming out of there. He really has good explosiveness. And he leads three to two. He leads three to two. He needs to use that quickness now on penetrating his offense. There's a good deep shot. The violet just dropped his hips and rotated him. That's what kept him out on that. Well, as I started to say, it is true. When Iowa forces its tempo on you, its pressure, this push, 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 you can't sit there and, uh, and expect it to look as busy as the other man. And it's, you're inclined to get called more often when you're wrestling against Iowa because you look like you're not doing anything. There's a deep shot on him, real quick. Hasn't secured it yet, and he's oh. got to be able to take the leg up high. And he still doesn't have it. Kissler's come all the way over top of him. There he comes back in on it. Still doesn't have control of it. This is a good scramble. He's, he still doesn't have the point. A lot of time left. We have just about a 50 seconds to go in the second period. Now Kissler's controlling the wrist right there. He has a partial wizard and he's controlling the wrist. Well, Violet really can't try to take him because the wrist is under control. Stalemate. You saw the Violet look over to his coaches and sort of shrug his shoulders. Yeah, that's the way it works out sometimes. Three to two. LaViolette does lead. Oklahoma won the, the last match here at 158. Johnson won over Alger 11 to nine. They won the last match. And then uh, <laughs> 20 seconds to go, three to two in the second period. They even keep that wrist under control. Still hasn't made only that one real good low-level attack. Now we go to the third period with LaViola, John LaViola of the Sooners leading Marty Kistler, three to two. We go to the third period with this time Kissler down. Kissler had his choice in the second period and he picked up. Oh, three to two. I keep calling Leviola the head, don't I? Now what am I? Everybody's pointing at me and saying, oh, the score is wrong, three to two. And I'm wondering why. Well, it's because Iowa leads three to two. And so Leviola's gonna have to get busy. 
but needs to be able to control that arm in there now. It's a good move by Kessler rolling out against the reversal. And it's now five to two in favor of Kistler. I gave uh, Kistler the penalty point, or LaViolet rather than Kistler. And he has that arm tight up tight. This is where LaViolet has been so quick at escaping before, popping his hips out, turning for that point. Five to two. The coaches from Oklahoma are exonerating their athlete. You're, you're losing this match, you've got to get going. Escape for Violet made it five to three. There's no riding time, so it's it's up to what's happening in the last minute. I hear Lanny Davidson out there saying, "You wrestle this last minute." Yes, he was he was telling his athlete, "If you'll go for one minute, you have a chance to win it." But Kistler's not going to let him. He makes the shot in low. Now to prevent knee injury, right now you can see the referee on the back side. He's, he can't take that heel any further, so he comes up and locks above the knee. Crystal Violet's leg is blocked. He can't go any way but the way he's going. Now he comes in behind him. And there he gets the two. Gets the take down. Escape. Escape makes it se seven to four. Lots happened in the last period. A reversal and a takedown for Kistler. This is where Iowa often beats teams in the last period. Well, they're tired, but they have the they have the ambition, the intensity to keep on going when they're tired. They'll wrestle hard when they're tired. So it's more a mental attitude than it is, uh, you know, a, a desire. Everybody would like to stop when they're tired. Iowa keeps going when they're tired. Here he's going to score another one. No riding time. There's no riding time, but Marty Kistler scores a good big win over John Lavile of Oklahoma. It's nine for Kistler, four for LaViolet. And that makes the team score 17 to 11 in favor of the Hawkeyes. So the Sooners got a one, a one match winning streak there. That's well, all. They had their chances, just didn't quite take advantage of them. And definitely Iowa should be favored here. There's a happy man, Marty Kistler. He gives you his 100%. He goes out there and gives you three periods. And it was only three to two at the end of the second period. And he won the last period six to two, and that made the difference. Here's Rico Ciparelli, number two rank for Iowa, against a sophomore from Ponca, Oklahoma, Steve Ryan, who doesn't care. He went right out after uh, Mr. Rico Ciparelli. Ryan has that good low single, and he almost got it. Now Ciparelli counted him out and was back in control. No points yet. Got to be able to have his knees inbounds. Still nothing in this position. So he just can't quite move up or he'd go off. There he's going to get the thing. His knees are still inbound. Good fight through on the edge. Two to nothing. Ciparelli. And it's 177 pounds. Steve Ryan. This is what. This is where Oklahoma hoped to have Melvin Douglas, but uh, he was ruled ineligible. His eligibility had actually run out. He was not able to get the extra year. And so they're going with Steve Ryan, a sophomore. Well, I think they're going to be happy if they can get out of this thing without giving up six. Uh, Ciparelli's such a good pinner. Ryan's fairly inexperienced. And sooner or later, Ciparelli's going to catch you where you are out of position. Well, it gets interests lots me. of falls. It interested me uh, this year, Chuck, to see that Rico Ciparelli, who just got in on another single leg and scored two points there to make it four to one. Of his 17 wins this year, only three of them have been by fall. That's really a change, but you know, I think he's working a lot more on a weight program. He's he's in now on the leg. Now watch him follow it up. He gets the, the leg, pulls it in close to him, and then starts to find the other one and work his way back up on top to score the two points. Here he is off the whistle. Cross face. He's good with Cross it. face cradle. He's got it. He's got a lot. And there it is. Now, even though they broke free, he had the ball prior to breaking free. 
Chipperelli went right from his referee's position on top, threw what is called a cross-face cradle, locked it up, and pinned Ryan Boom in a minute and 31 seconds of the match. You see that sweater there? <laughs> Rico's her guy. And that, that clinches at least a tie here for Iowa against Oklahoma because it would take two straight pins in the upper weights for Oklahoma to tie Iowa. It's now 23 to 11 in favor of the Hawkeyes. And I don't think it's gonna happen, but then I've been wrong before. Strange things sometimes do. But I think that Goldman's going to try to prove something in this match. He has three previous wins over Chade from Oklahoma. And Chade had that one win that really counted last year in the national finals. Dan Chade against Dwayne Goldman. I was uh, a little surprised in a way that Chade is wrestling because he's had the flu, I know. And uh, now that the match is uh, beginning to look doubtful, thought maybe Coach Dan Abel might hold him out, but I'm sure it was Chade's choice. Yes, it uh, may be just that he's going to try to get some experience against the style of Goldman. Win or lose, they can get ready to go against him in the national championship. That's what they'll all be looking for. Dan Chade couldn't touch Goldman last year when he needed to until they got to the national finals, and that's when it counted. And Dwayne Goldman has finished as a runner-up in the nationals three consecutive years. And I think if there's a man in his way, this might be the one right here. Beat him last year, and uh, I know that Goldman certainly wants to win this match and the rest of them. The Chade's surprising uh, Goldman last year was that he had a low-level attack late in the match. He tends to want to be an upper-body wrestler. He has a lot of freestyle Greco experience, and he likes to have that attack go from the waist up. And then in the national tournament, he hit the low-level attack. That was Mark Johnson you were looking at a moment ago who is uh, assistant coach for Dan Gable, a very important man in the Iowa program. When, when you see Goldman doing that shoulder pop back out, that's when he becomes very dangerous. He's uh, diversifying his offense a little bit here by wrestling from the closed position. In the past, he's always tried to work, work from the outside. Now, he's doing more inside wrestling with his hands on his opponent this year. No score. We go back to the middle. A minute and 11 seconds to go. Iowa leads Oklahoma 23 to 11. Those last two victories by Kistler and Chipperelli, especially Chipperelli's fall, have just almost put it completely out of reach here. This is a rematch of the national title match last year. And Goldman gets the double leg and goes for two. Boy, he saw the chance and he went right at it. Nice little head tap on that before he went in there, and he's really tough on that attempt to get him over, too. Goldman is not, you'd have to say, a pinner. He's had 16 wins this year, none of them by fall. And last year he had more than ever before, six in his entire career out of all his many wins, all, more than 100. He's only had eight pins. He's keeping a lot of pressure on Chade from Oklahoma now, just with his ride. You see the clock clicking away, and that's preventing Chade from scoring because Goldman's keeping the pressure on him. End of the period. And a big hand from the crowd goes up for Dwayne Goldman, who got the takedown he was looking for. Oklahoma takes down. Second so Oklahoma is making some strategy discussions. So he's in deep on this now. Just follows. Look at his steps. He stays right with him for about 10 feet. A couple of steps. Gets the takedown. Oh, he saw his chance, and he, he jumped like a cat that time. And Shade now has to come from behind. He's down two to nothing. In the position he's in, he's kind of sitting forward. Either going to switch out of that position or get his arm chopped, get knocked down. Put a lot of weight on those hands. It's a good way to get on up. Goldman driving hard. He's been able to keep Chade off his base for a good 15 seconds of the period until right there. Now he wants to build his up, build his base, 
Get his head and chest up in the air and then start to stand up. Take that short sit out. And Goldman lets him out. It's two to one. With a minute and a half to go in the second quarter. It's interesting to watch the strategy get the rest of the way they're out here. Tate has to get it. Goldman's normally an aggressor. I'm sure he'll go right back at him. Two to one, Goldman, who was second in the Nationals last year, Che, the man who beat him for the title. When he gets under that arm, that kind of takes away Che's offense unless he comes off it real quick and hits a headlock. Got his head under, but couldn't get his hips with it. There, are good, his hips started. Back to the center, two to one. In favor of Goldman. Open it up. Open it up. For Carver Hawkeye Arena. Open it up. Goldman oh, almost had that. <laughs> Lazy yeah. in there, but couldn't keep it. All right, he had his arms out there, just didn't quite have his hips in with it. We have uh, 45 seconds to go. Second period. Goldman and Black leads by one. Now, you're not seeing a lot of scoring, but you haven't seen Phil Henning giving any warnings here for stalling, either. This kind of takes away the offense when you get under those arms deep like that. Again, you saw him try to go all the way under. Now, again, each man tried one of his favorite moves there and didn't get it. Seen Chate, he just pop his head under in that high crotch, but he just hasn't been able to get his hips in underneath Goldman's too too well uh, positioned. And we're awfully close to the end of the second period. It's two to one Goldman. He got a takedown in the first period on a double leg, and then Chate escaped to start this period, and that's the only scoring so far. Two periods gone. Goldman two, Chade one. Iowa 23, Oklahoma 11 in the team score. In our 10th season of college wrestling, our second week on Iowa Public Television, Stan Abel out there saw some hopes go a glimmering here. He, uh, he got a couple of big wins at 126 and 134 tonight. And Johnny Johnson managed to avenge a loss earlier this season against Royce Alger, but that's been it. Well, Chade doesn't mind this position. You know, he, he likes to stay in behind. He tends to do, be a pretty good man with the legs. You see him throw the leg there, but he wasn't there. But he got it right over the top. Reversal makes it four to one goal. We call that jumping the leg. He knocked this man back to the mat and then went around and tried to put the leg on the other side. Goldman just elevated his hips and dumped him right over the top. Now, this is going to be the last time they'll meet before the Nationals. The importance of this match is going to be in uh, seedings when they get down to the end. It's definitely going to put gold in the driver's seat if he wins it. They don't go by na national placings last year. Now, Chade tries to, he picks him, and he dumps him, he sweeps him. Now he comes around the other side and goes to put the leg in, and Goldman just elevates his hip, dumps him right over the top, score the reversal. Here we go again in the center, four to one, Goldman on top. Goldman's been good here, he's got the leg in deep. There really isn't very many places he can go with this. He's got his arm trapped, got his shoulder posted. May end in a stalemate if he doesn't let go of the leg. Henning says he's got to get away from that hole. A minute and eight seconds to go. It's a 12-point team lead for Iowa over Oklahoma. The only way the Sooners could tie Iowa, they can't beat him, is if Chade got a some kind of a miraculous pin here toward the end, and Mark Tatum did the same thing at heavyweight. Number one ranked Hawks. My fault. Well, it's more feasible that the second one might happen yeah, than, than it is this one. No. At heavyweight, it's Mark Tatum against Andy Heyman of Iowa City, a freshman at Iowa. And, and Tatum is nationally ranked for Oklahoma. Shade on the bottom in the referee's position. Goldman cut off his first move. Well, Goldman's been very effective on top of taking away Chade's ability to just score easy points. He's making him work for him. Four to two. Riding time, oh, a lot of riding time for 
for Goldman. So although he leads by two, he really leads by three. Because the riding time can't be made up. Basically, the only way Chade's going to beat him now is if he can score a takedown to his back. He does have some throwing ability. Goldman's got good position. This is where he's good. When he starts to get that little stutter step there, puts his hands on you, and then backs out. And the next time, you don't know whether he's coming or not. 20 seconds to go. Now he's in deep. And that was going to happen. That had to happen. You can see that Chade was getting a little desperate there toward the end, and, and Goldman was right where he wanted to be. He just had to wait for a mistake, and he leads six to two. A big win for Goldman against last year's national champion. A seven to two win with the riding time for Dwayne Goldman of Iowa. Who Hardly looks tired, does he? <laughs> Well, he deserves the number one rating. There's no question about that. And the team score is now Iowa 26 and Oklahoma 11. 7 to 2, the winner, Goldman over Chase. And now we go to heavyweight. Oklahoma can no longer win the meet, but we'll get a chance here to look at the sixth ranked heavyweight for Oklahoma, Mark Tatum, a junior from Ponca City, Oklahoma, against a freshman from Iowa City and a considerably smaller fellow, too, than uh, Tatum. Freshman Andy Hamer. Well, they have about the same height. They're both about 5'11 to 6 feet. But Heyman could be a 90 pounder if he had to be, and Tatum weighs 270 pounds. Well, I, I think uh, Heyman didn't believe he was going to find himself all the way in on that leg, and he was. <laughs> it happened too quickly. It, it may not appear to be much of a factor, but when you find somebody that's uh, 50 pounds heavier, that causes a lot of problems for you to move that mass around. Well, you do have to move at him from the sides, angles, don't you? You don't dare get under him and come directly at it. Right, you always have to get an angle. You're always trying to get the hips turned slightly. And usually you use some kind of shucks or some kind of drags or some kind of side singles, but very rarely attack that power straight on. Well, you saw, you're seeing number four Oklahoma tonight. And next Tuesday at 9 o'clock on College Wrestling, you'll see number two ranked Penn State test these same Iowa Hawkeyes. You saw the team score there, 26 to 11. Iowa has won six of the nine matches so far, including two pins, one by Kevin Dresser, the other by Rico Ciparelli. Heyman's made a couple of low-level attacks that were close. It's almost, uh, as you said, he, he didn't realize that he'd be as close to getting it as he was. Warning, both wrestlers have shots. Warning, both wrestlers have shots. You heard Phil Henning say it's a warning both ways. You see Tatum fighting to try to get that, that overhook on both sides that he, he'll throw out of there. And we're a minute from the end of the first period. Andy Heyman of Iowa City. He won one state title. Uh oh, now they're not very happy with each other here. I don't know how that started. There's a little frustration and immaturity here, probably. Got to be in a lot of these push and shove matches before you understand what's really going to take place. What's happening is that uh, Tatum is cupping Heyman down real hard on the head, making those cuts. Stalling against Heyman for backing out, and Tatum gets the first point. We put some hard cups down on him. One to nothing in favor of the Oklahoma man. Now either man's out of position right here, Doug. If the other one would hit a good snap down, probably drop him right on his hands and knees. He's trying to go under it instead of pulling it down, get him out of position. Good move, but it was in the wrong place. It was on the edge of the mat instead of in the center of it. It's a little safer over there. If it misses, then you still don't get taken down yourself. If you get it, 
looks good off the edge. Got to do it out here. Yeah, you get an old wow from the crowd, but nothing from the scoreboard. It's 26 to 11 Iowa over Oklahoma. At the heavyweight match, here we are between the first and the second periods. There's the man who is now definitely the winningest wrestling coach in the University of Iowa history. This will be the 161st win. He's had some real strong performances, but he's had some that probably bother him a lot. You see, Danny said, what happened? <laughs> he was talking to one of his coaches and didn't hear the uh, PA. Yeah. Big deal. <laughs> He's frustrated with this team, Doug. You can tell it in his facial expressions and his attitude. He's appreciative of the fans acknowledging him, but he wants all of those guys to wrestle like the three or four that look so good. Tatum starting on top, could not hold Heyman, and it's one to one. Heyman's escape. Coach from Oklahoma did not like that. You know, he threw something before it was there. I think somebody's going to get frustrated in this match before too long and make a mistake. They're, they're making more of those uh, sparring type of moves than they are really 100% effort toward now. Heyman has some throwing ability, he has a good freestyle background, just doesn't have to use it yet. than the other times. There have been no takedowns. And it's one to one. His dad says that's good. There'll be no fingernails left up in that row. No. By the end of this match, with 48 seconds left in the second period, it's one to one. Tatum got his point when Heyman backed out and was penalized. They'd, they'd each been warned before, and Heyman got his escaping at the beginning of this period. Two to one now. Scoreboard has it two to one, and I'm not sure why. Well, they've both been penalized for stalling. One man scored an escape. All right. That's what you're here for, Chuck, man. You're the expert. Sometimes I one wonder. Plus, one plus one is two. <laughs> I get a little confused when we get in those high figures. <laughs> That's close. It's close. End of the second period. Now it's Tatum's choice, and he's going to decide where to go this time. He wants down. There's Dan Gable's father. That's Matt Gable from Waterloo. He's set through a lot of wrestling matches in his sure day, has. hasn't he? <laughs> sure has. And most of them winning ones. That's right. Almost all of them. When Anybody that thinks they spent time on the bench, I'll ask Matt how many, how many hours he spent there. <laughs> Carver Hawkeye Arena. We're having a quick timeout for uh, Andy Heyman. No time on this. It's uh, apparently a little blood showing, so there's no time on it. Yeah, he has a. Now you can bleed as much as you want to, and there's no time injury time. But as soon as you get hurt, then start to work that two-minute clock. We have two minutes of wrestling left here at the heavyweight. Mark Tatum of Oklahoma, he's out right now. 2-2, two -two. they're dead even. He's in deep on that double. Good, good counter effort by Heyman, pull him right up out of there. He's in again. Tatum is forcing it now, he's really working hard. I think he's trying to uh, influence the referee by making those efforts. He yep. doesn't stay on the legs long enough to really act like he wants it. Because each man has lost a point here for inactivity. In the strategy of a match, you can almost count on your fingers, though. The referee's going to look at this as offense and going to look at that as defense. 
Can I influence him by making my effort? A minute to go between Tatum and Heyman. We're working on toward the end of uh, Heyman's a career as a wrestler without having to be contested because I know Simlinger, the real good heavyweight from Charles City, just finished the football career and is now going to be out working out, so he'll be contested for a spot here shortly. Uh, Tatum has made all the moves in this period. And a warning, there it is. It's against Heyman. It's a penalty, and Tatum takes the lead 3-2. to two. And it's legitimate. Uh, Heyman really hadn't made an offensive uh, move in the last period. That's what you call influence? That's what I was talking about earlier. It's the name of the game when you get in certain spots. 20 seconds to go. There's a low-level attack by him and just didn't quite get him turned. Now Tatum has worked hard in the last, this last period. Those are influence grabs right there. Yeah. And he won with it. But he paid off. Tough match, but Tatum wins 3-2 to two over Heyman. And Oklahoma wins its fourth match of the meet. And although the score would seem to be closer if it was six wins for Iowa and four for Oklahoma, it didn't turn out that way. 26-14, to 14 because a couple of those wins for the Hawks were big. Falls by Dresser and by Ciparelli at 142 and 177. A superior for Heffernan at 150. And other wins by John Regan at 18. Kissler at 67 over John LaViolet. And Goldman over his, the man who beat him for the national title last year, Dan Shade at 190. And Oklahoma got one big win that could have led to something, maybe. Joel Melchiori at 126 over Egelin. And then other victories by Neville, Johnson, and Tatum in upper weights. But it's Iowa 26 and the Sooners of Oklahoma, 14. And a reminder, Iowa Public Television's next 10th anniversary broadcast of college wrestling will be next Tuesday, January 14th at 9 o'clock p.m. as these same number one ranked Iowa Hawkeyes take on the number two ranked Penn State Nittany Lions. Should be terrific. We're looking forward to that one. And uh, Chuck, I'll tell you, if they're gonna handle number four teams this way, what are they gonna, how are we gonna do with number two teams and number three teams? We're gonna find out. I think there may be a little more of a scrap in some of the matches, but I, as I said in the early part of the show, I think Iowa has too much balance for any team in the country. Well, we'll see. We'll see. There's Dan Gable, who became the winningest coach tonight in I University of Iowa history with his 161st victory. Talking to Andy Heyman, who came close, but not quite a victor at heavyweight. That's Iowa against number two ranked Penn State Nittany Lions next week. Here on our 10th anniversary broadcast of college wrestling, we'll have the same kinds of uh, features with it, too. We like to look back into the past and see the great stars of the last 10 years. We have some surprising people to see yet. We hope you'll plan to watch.